So, yeah, both of icon fonts. Nice little animation. Well, really, this talk could have, might as well have been titled, uh, Let's Learn Everything We Know or We Can About Font Face. So, as Jen said, uh, I'm Zach Leatherman. I live in Omaha, Nebraska. Anybody from Nebraska? Hey, one guy. Yeah, I know him, yeah. Um, but I work for Filament Group, and our tagline kind of is, we want to make the web work for everybody. And so we kind of took this approach when we were thinking about how to implement uh, font icons. But Carl Sagan once said, if you wish to make a font icon from scratch, you have to first invent the universe for any Cosmos fans out there. So this is kind of the agenda that we're going to go through today. Uh, we're going to do a little bit about font face. We're going to go over Unicode, how fonts look when they load, uh, one weird trick that we can use to fix all our font icon problems. And then I'll go through a little bit of my magazine subscription preferences. Um, Sarah wasn't a, font, a cat person, but I am, so you guys get to suffer through that. Um, all right, so Fontface was first introduced in the super modern year of 1997. Um, it was in Netscape 4, if you can believe that, which was only two years after the font tag was introduced in HTML 3.2. Um, if you guys don't remember the font tag, that's okay because Pepperidge Farm remembers. <laughs> uh, but back to font face, it was first introduced in CSS2 and then removed in CSS2.1. A lot of people don't know that. And then re added in CSS3. Just to go over the syntax really quickly, uh, you have a font family at the top. You don't need quotes in there. A lot of people say you need quotes, but if you just have white space in between your font family name, you don't need quotes. Um, and then a list of URLs pointing to your font formats. So um, the most common, the most simplified version just has two different formats. There's a lot of different formats you can choose from. And if you ever feel like you're drowning in the sea of different font formats, you can just ask our good friend David Hasselhoff. He'll tell you what formats he use. So this is the can I use uh, layout for browser support for the WAF format. Really good modern browser support. Uh, but if we used WAF and only the WAF format, we'd be committing the most common mistake in computer science, which is the WAF by one error. It's going to get better, I tell you. All right, so we're adding true type support would be our next, our next type. Um, that gives us a little bit better Android. Oops. Yeah, Android support there. And if we need IE8, this actually works for IE6+, plus, but we at Filament Group, we cut the mustard for IE8+, plus, so this presentation is sort of tailored for that. Uh, we want to add the embedded open type format. And when you're adding the open, uh, embedded open type format, excuse me, um, you want to use this. There's a URL parsing problem in Internet Explorer, so you want to include this question mark pound IE fix to make it parse the URL correctly. So when you add uh, embedded open type, you get IE8. Nice. Um, but if you want Chrome on Windows, you want to add SVG. Now, Chrome on Windows already supports the WAF format, obviously. But it uses a, an older text rendering engine called GDI. And they're currently in the process of upgrading their text rendering engine to DirectWrite. And that upgrade is available in Chrome 35 behind a flag. Um, so when you look at your font icons in Windows, all the way from XP to Windows 8.1, it's not just an older Windows problem. Uh, the fonts will not look as crisp as maybe you want them to look. And the way to get around that is to add SVG, an SVG font, to our font stack. Oops. Sorry. And when you do that, it also buys us old iOS Safari, which is basically not used anymore. And uh, our lovely BlackBerry 6, if anybody tests on that. <laughs> A show of hands, who tests on BlackBerry 6? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> but OK, so I've tested this on BlackBerry 6, so you don't have to. Um, and you might think that you just plop it at the end of your, your source URL uh, list here. But that would be a mistake, because Chrome on Windows obviously supports some of those other fonts. And it, when it encounters a font uh, format that it knows, it uses the first one it, that it understands. 
So we get into some pretty gnarly code. We actually include a completely separate font face block inside of a media query that's WebKit only, which is not the nicest thing, but it solves our problem. And if you remember a little bit about BlackBerry 6, so we added this font face block to our page and we bring it up in our BlackBerry 6 browser. Uh, this is what it looks like. Not great, right? So BlackBerry 6 does support SVG fonts, but not really, um, because the, the text looks all jumbled up. So we can actually use another qualifier on our media query block to uh, sort of qualify that additionally. So this is the min resolution. It's a little flow chart for you. Since I'm wearing a tie, I'll put a flow chart up there. Um, so Internet Explorer and Firefox obviously don't support min device pixel ratio. Uh, min resolution buys us only Chrome and, and Opera, and Safari, mobile Safari, Android, and BlackBerry don't support that. So that font face block is only served to Chrome and Opera. So we lose old iOS Safari and, and BlackBerry there, but it solves the real problem that we're trying to fix, which was Chrome and Windows. All right, so everybody take a breath. That was a lot. We're going to go over just a super quick review. The top block is our normal font face block. The bottom block is the problem to fix uh, Chrome's GDI on Windows. And we can remove that after Chrome Direct Write goes to stable, which should be pretty soon, within the next couple versions, probably. All right, so yeah, that was a lot, I know. Um, so well, let's go to our happy place. Luckily, we're in Florida. We're already here. So what happens when we put this font face block on our web page? If we look at it in the dev tools, there's no request captured. If you just put a font face block on uh, your web page without actually using it inside the page, no font uh, will download. So I tested this in a bunch of different browsers, again, so you guys don't have to. Um, this actually worked in Android 2.3, which was I was kind of surprised, but not an i8, so i8 will just download everything. But if you want your font to download, you use it in a font family, right? Or if you want to do it dynamically later on, you can just assign a font family with JavaScript. All right, we made it through the first one, okay. Let's go over a little bit about Unicode. So basic Latin, Unicode, here's the different, uh, fonts are kind of made up of code points. It's kind of like the DNA of fonts. So for example, the code point hex 41 maps to uppercase A in basic Latin. Um, and that's how we can kind of use different fonts for the same uh, content, right? The content is assigned code points. We can just substitute fonts however we want. And then the higher Unicode ranges, we get into more interesting symbols, like 2261 is the triple bar mathematical symbol. And we also commonly use it for hamburger menus. Um, how many people have a hamburger menu on their site? All right, cool. Um, but these, the, every single code point kind of has a semantic meaning, right? So triple bar is kind of expected to be triple bar no matter what font, you, font family you use. And then you get even into higher ranges, you get into something called emoji. So emoji is kind of this, uh, it was first introduced on, on Japanese phones, I think. Um, but it gives you these bitmap characters that are assigned to these higher Unicode ranges. Um, but Moji isn't necessarily installed on cross browser either. It's not just an operating system level thing. You have to, your browser has to support it. So for instance, in Safari, you might see a pizza icon for that code point. But when you bring it up in Chrome, it doesn't show anything. And this is kind of what Jennifer Lawrence, I think, commented on when she was interviewed a while back. And she said, where's the pizza? I told you, get better. All right, so like Jennifer Lawrence, we might start to wonder how consistent are these glyphs cross-platform, cross-browser. Luckily, friend of the internet, John Holt Ripley, created this tool called Unify. And he's gone through and tested each of these Unicode characters individually for us. So if you check out his site, he has this huge matrix. Um, and he puts the glyphs on the left. And then he tests them in a bunch of different browsers. And this thing goes on probably, I don't know, forever. He tested on a bunch of different de devices and browsers. 
Um, so if, you, if you're going to use Unicode on your site, definitely check out these glyphs to make sure that they're cross-platform, cross-browser supported. And just from a, an accessibility perspective, the Unicode glyphs are maybe not read out loud like you might want them to be. So for instance, the triple bar, the hamburger menu, if you go into a screen reader and it encounters that character, it will read it aloud as identical to, which probably is not what you want when you're using it as a menu icon. But luckily, Unify is also tested in screen readers as well. So inside of John Holt Ripley's tool, he has all of these uh, test results here that you can check out. And he tested in Chromevox, JAWS, NVDA, and VoiceOver. So you don't have to test in that easier e either. It's making it super easy for you guys. And I kind of mentioned that uh, Unicode has, each one of those code points kind of has a semantic meaning. So there's a section of Unicode called the private use area. And uh, inside the private use area, there is, it's kind of a free for all. There is, there's no semantic of the code points inside of the private use area. And this is to avoid collision with other defined characters. And because of the kind of free for all nature of the private use area, you can get kind of unpredictable results, even with the same browser on different platforms. So for example, if I bring up uh, the private use area Unicode in Safari, it shows these black boxes for those code points. But in mobile Safari, it will show these weird guess who character looking things. Um, but typically, uh, on icon font authors will use these to avoid uh, overloading a, an, an existing code point. All right, we went over Unicode. Now we're going to go over a little bit about uh, how fonts load. So our font face request goes out into the world, leads the test. How does it look when it's in flight? So this is kind of the quintessential font face problem, right? When our font face uh, is loading, the font is invisible. The f it doesn't show fallback text. So the, the, top is, or the top section is using a local font. The bottom section is using a font face. And while the request is, is, is in progress, nothing is shown to the user. And much in the same way we might, this character from Duck Dynasty would be, the, the text is invisible. So this is the flash of invisible text, or the Hoyt. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that, but um, but that's actually good for uh, icon fonts, right? Because no fallback characters are shown while the font face is being requested and while it's being loaded. And then once the font face successfully completes, uh, our primary font family is shown, which reveals our icon. But it's uh, bad for content fonts, right? Because the text might load after your images do. So it's not good for uh, users if the user wants to read your content as soon as possible. So what some browsers have started to do, and this is in Chrome Canary currently in Firefox, is they add a timeout. So after three seconds, and uh, it will re-render the text using a fallback font. And then once the font face completes successfully, it will re-render the text using the primary font face. So that's the, yeah, that's the primary one. This is the flash of unstyled text, or fout. It's great names for these things. But it, so a timeout is really good for content fonts, right? Because we want huge paragraphs of text to be usable to the user as soon as possible. But it's bad for icon fonts because when the three seconds, the three three second timeout has been reached, we'll often show this fallback character which is completely unintelligible to the user, right? They have no idea what that is. And then once our font loads successfully, that's when our icon then switches from that fallback glyph to the primary icon. This is a real problem, right? Because I took the screenshot, someone had posted a screenshot on Twitter, and I took, the, I took that image that they had shared. Um, and so GitHub uses icon fonts currently. And so someone, I, I'm pretty sure this was probably taken in Firefox because Fire, I think this is the default glyph that shows in Firefox when the, in those higher Unicode ranges. So someone took this after the timeout, after the three second timeout had, had passed. They took their screenshot 
uh, before the font had successfully loaded. So if you can believe it, I kind of agree with how uh, Internet Explorer does it, right? Because they show, they don't show uh, invisible text at all. They show the fallback right from the beginning. So the content is immediately usable, immediately readable. Um, so plus one to Internet Explorer for that. Um, and this is, this is how it should be for content fronts, right? We want our content to be as quickly accessible to the user as, as, as possible, especially if they're on a really slow connection or conference Wi-Fi. So I did some testing for uh, cross-browser timeouts as well. So I kind of mentioned that Chrome and uh, Chrome Canary and, and Firefox have a three-second timeout. Internet Explorer doesn't matter because they show fallback from, right from the beginning. Um, and then all of these, there might be, a, do you see a unifying characteristic of the browsers that are on the right side? Um, they're all WebKit. Um, so an, an interesting thing that I ran into um, was that in Safari, in mobile Safari, if the font loads after 60 seconds, it just throws it away. <laughs> so you have this, this hidden text on your page. The user can interact with it. They can't see anything. Um, if your font successfully loads after 60 seconds, it does nothing with it. It doesn't show a fallback font. It doesn't do anything. It's just white screen forever. So um, not the most user-friendly thing. And also another consideration, um, what happens when the user hits the stop button? So the font face is in flight. Um, the font, uh, the text is invisible. The user might hit the stop button. I think maybe I want to read the text. Maybe the text will show up when I hit the stop button. But in all the browsers I tested, if the font or if the text was invisible, hitting the stop button does nothing. Uh, it doesn't show a fallback font. It, it does nothing. Um, if you hit the stop button in Chrome Canary after the three-second timeout has passed and it's already showing the fallback font, then um, obviously the text will stay visible on the screen. But um, in most of the other browsers, the stop button basically does, does nothing to font face. And whether or not this is intentional, this is behavior is bad for content fonts, but it's good for icon fonts, right? Because we don't want the fallbacks to be showing all the time. I don't think that Boingo really intended this, the baseball icon to be showing right next to their login button, or maybe the lipstick at the bottom with their flight finder. I don't think that was necessarily intentional. All right, so how do we solve these problems? So first, just a use case. So I'm just going to describe the, the simplest use case is a decorative icon. Um, it's basically just a span sitting next to some uh, text that describes what the icon actually does. And we use a separate element for our icons um, because that's the best way to hide them from screen readers, right? So because we pair with descriptive text, we can hide the visual icon from the screen readers altogether so they don't, they don't read that um, triple bar or identical to that I mentioned earlier. And so I created this little library called Off Font Guard. Um, it's in the filament group. <laughs> you love that, okay, yeah. Um, it's in the filament group uh, repository on GitHub. You can check that out and there's a little test, a little utility inside of that called Font Face Onload. And the only thing font face onload does is it gives you a callback when your font face has successfully completed. So this is not the same as uh, like a modernizer feature test um, because it will actually measure the dimensions of the font changing and it knows that the font has successfully loaded actual font content. Um, and it will give you a callback that you can execute um, when your font face has loaded. So in this case, I'm passing it a my icon font, font family. I pass it a couple of glyphs that I know it can use to, to measure the dimensions of it. Um, and then I pass it a success uh, callback. And then inside that success callback, I add a CSS class to the top level to the document. So at that point, when my icon font uh, exists, then I know that my font has loaded successfully. And so this is the CSS we use to implement this decorative icon. We use kind of that same like CSS class guard like approach where we assign uh, a class to the top of the document. So we know at this point when this CSS is applied to the page, we know our font is successfully loaded and it, we don't have to worry about fallback font. So <clears throat> we assign our, our new font family and we use CSS content to show the glyph. And if you are using Typekit's web font loader, it will basically do the same thing. Um, it's just a little bit bigger. So if you already have that on your page and you're using it to load your content fonts today, 
um, you can use this library to add the um, CSS Garden class to your document element as well. Another promising native solution is the CSS font loading module level three. Um, it's currently going through the W3C. And this is the syntax for that. It uses the uh, nice promises spec. It's basically the same thing, but it's, it doesn't, uh, you, it, it's hooked into the actual font face requests going behind the scenes, and we don't have to do magic uh, in JavaScript to, to determine second hand when the font is loaded. Um, so we just pass it a size and a font family, and then we get, uh, we, we pass a callback to the then function, as promises do. And if you want more information on that, uh, Bram Stein has, has created a polyfill. He's working on a polyfill. Uh, the spec changed, and so he has to completely, I mean, he had a working solution, but the spec changed, so he has to go back and change it. Um, so yeah, if you want more information on the native solution, definitely follow, that, follow along with that. Uh, but this my icon font class that we add to our document element kind of solves all our problems, right? We now control the foi, foid, and the fout. Um, and we don't have any more Unicode surprises, right? We control all the fallbacks. Uh, we don't have any more timeout surprises um, because we control uh, if the font is loaded successfully or not. And we, there's no more stop button surprises, right? So on our decorative icon, this is what it looks like while it's loading. It doesn't take up any real estate on the page. Um, that's where the, the void would normally take place. And after three seconds, if the browser does have a timeout, nothing happens because we test to make sure that the font is loaded successfully. And this is when the, the fout was normally, would normally take place. And then when font face load comes back, that's when we assign our document class and our CSS is applied. So we don't show any fallback glyphs. All right, so that was the one weird trick. And so next we're gonna take it a little bit fancier. Magazines, all right. So here's another use case, right? We wanna transform content or text into an icon. While it's loading, we show fallback text or a fallback sentence. And then after it loads, we replace that with, a, with an icon. Not the most real estate friendly solution, um, but we'll, I'll go over some more later for that. So here's the giant block of code for that. Um, I've actually divided it into the red, is, the red applies before this font is loaded, and the green applies after the font is loaded. So it makes it a little bit easier. Um, we just hide the icon before the font is loaded successfully, um, switch it to display and line block, and then we use an accessibility hide feature that uh, I think probably everyone already knows about. It's built into HTML5 boilerplate. I just stole this one right out of HTML5 boilerplate. Um, yeah, so the, our fallback text is still accessible to screen readers. Um, so it will still be able to read that Facebook fallback text even though it's not visible. Um, yeah, so it's still screen reader friendly. So another use case is uh, transforming a Unicode glyph to an icon. So this is the triple, triple bar Unicode 2261 hamburger menu icon. Not the most intuitive thing. A lot of people are using it. Um, if you agree with the super uh, TechCrunch article that came out earlier this week, they kind of wanted to kill the hamburger menu. So I'm here to offer you a few, a few alternatives. Um, Brett Jangford said that we should start adding text to the bottom of our hamburger menus calling it the hamburger helper. You could also use a hamburger emoji <laughs> or a veggie burger or a gluten-free hamburger <laughs> or Jed Smith, Schmidt's uh, man burger from Facebook <laughs> or Scott Gell's hungry man burger meal. Just put the whole image on there, who cares? Um, but so this is kind of the most real estate friendly approach, right? So while the font is loading, we show our fallback font, or our fallback glyph. And then after the, the font successfully completes, that's when we show our fancy font face icon, which is, has the nice, so much better, has the nice little rounded, yeah. Um, so here's the code to do that. It's a little bit gnarlier than our last uh, approach, but Again, I've divided it into two different sections. So we show our uh, icon, or our default Unicode glyph right up front, 2261, hamburger menu. We show our uh, default fallback text 
which I think in this case was the Facebook text, um, using that same accessibility hiding feature that I described at the last use case. And then when the font successfully loads, we switch the glyph. We can use whatever we want because we're switching it in CSS content. Um, we use the new font family, and then we adjust our font size and line height to size the icon as we might want, want it to be. All right, so the thing I really want to communicate with this presentation is that we kind of have different goals for icon fonts and, co and content fonts, right? Since we kind of tagged icon fonts onto an existing mechanism that we already used for uh, content fonts, we need additional tools to handle them separately. And for right now, that means we have to use JavaScript. Someday we may get a CSS-only solution, and I don't think there's anything currently going through the specs for that right now. So if you're interested, you can form a community group. Uh, thank you. That's all I got.